when you're in the middle of it, you think, I'm live, that's fine. <sighs> he worries about what I'm going to say. <laughs> Have you ever done anything, and when you're in the middle of it, you wish Jan started? Yeah? I didn't realise how complex and difficult it would be breaking spiritual gifts down into, because there's just so many. In fact, if we did all the spiritual gifts that are listed in the Bible, I think we would be here for at least six months, maybe more. And what I deliver on a Sunday is nowhere near enough to be called teaching. You really, really need to read it yourself, investigate it yourself. And honestly, I'm not just saying it as a pastor. You know, I can't see you. It's Ian, Lee. Can't have a good-looking chap in the church and not see him, can you? <laughs> see? I'll be slandered for that next as well because it's live. But anyway... Um, <clears throat> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's as I'm getting older, I need glasses, probably need them thicker. Um, so I really, what Martin and I have, f have found over the weeks and weeks that we've been really delving in and listening to all the preachers is it's challenged us about what we believe, and it's excited me, actually. Um, it's put a fire back in my belly that was sort of going a little dull with, with processes, so I'll just encourage you. So today we're looking at evangelism. I decided to cut it down. I'm just going to look at the five-fold ministries, which is apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher. So at least you know you're coming near the end now. And then we'll just see what the Holy Spirit leads us to say next. So when I started to look at evangelism, I got quite excited, really, if I'm honest. Um, am I an evangelist? I suppose I have to have a little bit if I'm going to be a pastor. Um, but it just fired my belly up into, do we really grasp what these gifts are? Um, the gift of evangelism means one who brings good news. Well, isn't that great? When somebody wants to bring you good news, it's like, do you, you notice people go, do you want the bad news or the good news? The bad news, if you don't accept the good news, you're dead. Yeah? Amen? Someone who shares the good news of the gospel. That somebody who shares about Jesus, but does it in a way that penetrates the hardness of people's hearts. We find the word evangelist used in Acts 21.8. And then again, there's another word that I really struggle to say, but leaving the next day, we reached... We ain't got any. I know what it is. Acts 21, 8. Yep. Leaving the next day, we reached Caesarea and stayed at the house of Philip the Evangelist, one of the seven. And then also in 2 Timothy 4, 5, but you keep your head in all situations and your hardship. Do the work of an evangelist Discharge all the duties of your ministry. I just want you all to take note that even though we talk about the gift of evangelism, we are all called to evangelize. We're all called to share the good news. We're all called to share our testimony. The only person in the Bible that is actually called an evangelist as I find it, is Philip. But did anyone else spread the good news? Did anyone, was it that it was nobody else? All the disciples, Paul, we talked about. Paul said, I'm here to advance the gospel. So it is for all of us to share our story in this walk. Yeah. So Peter 1, 3, 15 says, but in your heart set apart Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks to give you the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. So he's saying, 
we must be ready to give an account of our faith. Always be ready. We have discipleship groups, we have evangelistic groups, and it's all about preparing. But in truth, it says it here. Remember to be ready to give the reason for the hope. And do it in gentleness. Don't get a Bible and bash somebody over the head with it. It'll make them run. Your own experience, your own testimony has amazing power. The reason why you came to Christ is important that you're prepared to share it. If you're ashamed of it, then come back to God and ask him to change your heart. But it also says, when you're giving your story, make sure you condense it. I mean, let's face it. If I told anyone what has been going on in my life, even just over the last three years, let alone the last 42, I think the listener would run, wouldn't they? And they'd think, I don't think I want to be bothered with that. Three things to remember as as all, this is all of us, tell about your life before Christ. Be honest. We are all sinners. Don't hide and make it all clinical and sterile. Well, before I became a Christian, I was really quite good. Now, some people might be, but you're still a sinner. Every one of us, unless we have Christ in us, are sinners. So be truthful. Some of the greatest um, testimonies are those that have really had a hard life. Those Christians that, you know, were murderers, drug addicts, alcoholics, on their own, lonely, had a rough upbringing. You know, when they turn to Christ, they have a powerful message to give. Say how you met with Jesus So say who you were before and then tell them how you met with Jesus. Not everybody has that boom, life-changing experience within a few seconds. For some people, it's a gradual journey. But if you've accepted Jesus into your life, you have got a testimony. You have got a story about when you met with Jesus. Mine was through somebody missing Sundays at a football club that I ran. And I wanted to know why she missed Sundays. She told me she followed Jesus and I were like, well, you look a bit normal. (laughs) You know, I I had this vision that everybody went to church, dressed and behaved in a certain way. And she dressed like me and had three kids. She brought me to Jesus. She told me why, what her life was like before, how she'd come to know the Lord. And then the greatest thing is how your life has changed since knowing God. It doesn't mean that we're going to have this comfy, wonderful life. Not at all. But every one of us should have a story about how things have changed. You know, I remember Becca preaching on fear or faith. We've all got these examples of where something has happened and we can say we relied on God and we've seen change. Don't always have to be a limb growing. They are the miraculous, but you don't always have to be that. It's about, this is who I was, then I met Jesus, and this is who I am now. You wouldn't want to know me before I met Jesus. You might question now I have met Jesus for a different reason, but I'm a different person, but I'm still on a journey of learning and growing. But every one of us should have that urgency And I've been saying, I feel this urgency inside my spirit at the minute that something is going to happen. I have an urgency that we need to be declaring who God is. I am not embarrassed to say who I follow, but have been in the past. To my colleagues, I've kept it quiet. To my family that I know I haven't declared what I... I was frightened to say, well, I'll pray for you. Now, I say I pray, and I do go, Lord, make it happen. Sometimes it don't. And you have to teach them that as well, that prayers sometimes don't always go the way you want them to. My family 
since you've all been praying, are in a lot better place than they were three weeks ago. Even my daughter in prison is actually accepted. That's where she is. She said she's finding that she's having to face emotions that she'd never faced before. But we tell her about Jesus. We tell her we're praying for her. She dismisses it at the moment, but God is doing a work. I recently read, and this I found um, sad that somebody would write this, but then it made me question. The church has stopped evangelizing because we think we have to do something elaborate an elaborate event to bring people. And when it don't work, instead of asking the Holy Spirit to lead us into doing the right thing, we stop doing it. That's sad. It challenged me. It really did challenge me. I said to Martin, let's get in the marketplace. Get stoned, that's fine. Remember, we do the sowing and the watering, God does the growing. We just have to be obedient to do our part. We have to listen and be obedient and say what we want to do and move on. 1 Corinthians 3, 6 to 8 says, I planted the seed, Apollo, Apollos watered it, but God has been making it grow. He, so neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God who makes things grow. The one who plants and the one who waters have, has one purpose, and they will each be rewarded according to their labor. I think that is saying, you have your part, be obedient in it, God will do the rest. The trouble is, our society wants everything instant. We have microwaves. We have same-day delivery. I mean, not even next day. We have same-day delivery. We have everything. Even passports that used to take weeks can be done on the internet really quick. Everything, we want it now. And yet, for somebody that eats soya, you have to have things cooked slowly. They have to marinate. They have to soak in the goodness to be able to taste it. If we cooked pasta bolognese really quick, it'd be really tasteless. You have to marinate. And that's what we have to do sometimes. We, we have to accept that the message may not be instant. The message may not be... Um, sorry, I'm distracted. But you know how you get distracted, don't you? you? Yeah, it's my fault. Come back. Sometimes when you're waiting for a delivery, it's exciting. You know, if you, right, I'll have that and it'll come to today. The waiting, Christmas, kids get so excited in the waiting for Christmas, don't they? The build up and then it's all fights Christmas Day. But it's amazing, isn't it? That build up of waiting. We need to accept that not everything is going to be done the same day. Sometimes uh, I used to upset people as a parish nurse because they'd be working on people for months in, months out, months in, months out. They'd come and see me and pr it prompted my heart, ask them to give their life. And I'd go, look, you know, people have been talking to you for years. Isn't it about time you gave your life for Jesus? Yeah, I think so. And, I, and I'd be doing it and it'd be one after the other and it was amazing I had baptisms. I think um, Adrian came the same way. Don't you think you've been coming long enough now, mate? About time you, you know, it, we, but people have been talking to them and sowing the seeds for a long time. And then the Holy Spirit prompted. I don't know where I'm going now, but anyway. As long as we're prepared to share our story, no matter how short, don't matter if you make, you don't have to be articulate. It doesn't matter as long as you share it. Isaiah 55, 11, we quote this at times, but it is so, so real. So is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. When we speak out from an obedience by the Holy Spirit, 
It don't, it, it, it's not wasted. If it's a God word, if it's in scripture, nothing is wasted. Nothing. So let's start sowing. Let's start watering and allow God to bring growth. So if you are called to evangelize, what is the difference with the gift of evangelism? An evangelist has this real special passion to bring people to Christ. It's like a, a desire within that burns and burns. And until they're sharing the story to someone, they feel unfulfilled. A bit like I was saying last week about the apostle, we can try and squeeze them into the wrong thing, the wrong, um, the wrong hole, the wrong shape. And actually, an evangelist is the same. For some reason, we think they're different to what they are. We, but they're all individual. But the common thing is they have this desire, this passion within them to share the gospel. And they're not frightened to do so. They have this extra measure of faith that they can dig deep in. And it's in that digging deep that they are effective. They are the ones that want to go out to gather. They're not on about bringing in. They understand the gathering is to glorify God and to worship together and fellowship together because that's biblical. But their passion is get me out of here. Let's get and talk to my neighbor. Talk to the person in the shop. They're the ones that you'll see speaking about Jesus. They're not afraid to share. We used to um, be involved with a, a great street evangelist. Maybe some of you know his name was Chris Duffett. Duffett. And uh, he had an amazing gift. He worked with balloons and dramas and you know he would be one at Christmas that put a red carpet down outside I think it was um, a council uh, building red carpet with a, um, a travel cot he had security on each corner security standing there people can't help but ask who's coming said oh haven't you heard the king is coming the king is coming if you want to know more about the king come and talk to me he did amazing things, but he also sat. One day, I remember him sharing that he sat on the curbside with two women that had been selling their bodies and were drunk to deal with it. And he sat there and he brought them to the Lord. And they kept coming. They gave up prostitution. In fact, I'm sure he said, didn't he, that the pimps wanted to attack him. I'm sure that's what he said. But Chris Duffett, amazing evangelist in, in uh, Peterborough, and he, um, he does pub evangelism now as well. If you want to look him up, he's amazing. So what does the gift look like? As I've said, really, um, it's led by the Holy Spirit. And it, and it gives that confidence to someone, that conviction. It convicts them that somebody is going to come. Often they pray before they go out. Pray for somebody to cross my path. Whoever crosses my path, I'm going to share Jesus with them. They have a confidence in who they are. They have a strong desire, as I've said, to, to share the gospel, to bring others to Christ. They fully understand this life and death. You know, we like to hide it. If you do, if you do not believe in Jesus, you are dead. We try to be soft sometimes with it. You won't get a soft evangelist. They like, it naturally comes. They're not embarrassed to share the Jesus with strangers. In fact, it usually is a stranger that they share it with. They're able to minister to non-Christians. And in fact, we think we can minister to non-Christians, but often they try to avoid us. If you notice, if you think about your friends, most of them will be in the same, not click, but will be Christians. Whereas if you speak to an evangelist, they have a greater number of non-Christians as their friends. They're not afraid 
They're comfortable in who they are and in sharing who Jesus is. They lead people to Christ, of who many of us would be surprised about. Yeah, that's why prison ministry is so popular. Um, it, it's so transforming. So there are different ways in which we can evangelize. There's the one-to-one, -one, the relational, and there's the mass gatherings. Well, you all remember, even though he's passed away, Billy Graham. I think even you youngsters all know who Gr Billy Graham is. His name will continue. He's doing, um, he's not him, his son is doing some um, evangelistic movements around here. I will tell you, I forgot to bring it, but it um, looks very good. When I say round here, Sheffield, it's about nervous, but it's round here. So, um, but the thing is, they will have thousands come to Christ. The, the, do you remember the big tents of Billy Graham? No, you won't. The big tents of Billy Graham, thousands came and gave their life to Christ. But what does Billy Graham do? He walks off. He shares his faith. He calls people to Christ and then he goes by. Yeah, the rest is up to the local church. So you don't get many of them, really, do you? We don't, really. We've got Reinhard Bonke. We've got, um, I think, I, I hear less of this sort of tent ministry, really, now. Do you? It is, yeah. I think we've got more personal. But the, the relational evangelism is that they, first of all, they intercede for the person that they want to bring to Christ. They'll ask others, please, can you pray for my colleague that I work with every day? He really needs, he's got a tough time he needs to. Ian often rings us and go, I'm talking to so-and-so tomorrow and I really got it that I'm, I, I need to share about Jesus. Will you pray? Yeah. They prepare the way with prayer. So it's a bit like putting the landing, the um, airfield landing lights on. It's like, shh, let's get them so they can see the way. Let's prepare. They pray for the salvation. They pray for the Holy Spirit to prompt them when to share, how to share, and in what way. They also, they invest time in people's lives. Often, you know, this lady that brought me to Christ, she invested. She used to call me around for cups of coffee, never talked about Jesus. She just befriended me. She loved me. She knew I wanted to be loved and directed. And she did that. And then, then came the punchline. Then she she brought me to think, well, she's lovely, she's normal, she's not a crackpot, she's not after my money. I'll just listen to the next bit. She invested time. And the third thing is, which I can't find now. Oh, yeah, when you invest in time, you have to remember their story is more important than yours. I'll be honest, I'm I, I love to share. When I was a nurse, they said, don't give, your story, don't give anything about your story. And I used to have people sit there and they'd be struggling. And I think, well, I've gone through that. Oh, I'm not supposed to share my story. Well, it'd be on me. And it, and it was obviously stirring of the Holy Spirit. And I would say, do you know what? I'm not being able to take this pain off you but I am in the pit with you because I understand I've been in a similar situation and I really understand do you know that builds relationships be prepared to be vulnerable be prepared to be vulnerable yes their story is really important and there is not a story in their life that there isn't a story in the Bible that we can't share. You might not have witnessed some of the things, but the Bible has. There are stories in the Bible. I can see people doing this. It's cold air for you online that are watching on your sofas. 
We missed Ian Lithgow. He comes and turns it on in the night before and we forgot. An evangelist knows the, what message to share and to make it relevant to the listeners, which I've just said. Sharing the gospel when it is needed, knowing when somebody is hurting. You know, I said this morning, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Believe in that. If somebody is, bere is bereaved, share that story. If somebody has been rejected, share the Samaritan story. If somebody has not felt the love of a family, share the love of Jesus. Make it appropriate. And you can only do that if you listen first to what their problem is. And then make it real. It is real. I'm not saying lie. What we have in the Bible is real. And that's why right at the beginning when I first came into post, I used to say, please, study your Bible and pray. Because when you get to share your story, you want to be able to, or they share their story, you want to be able to link it with Scripture. And you can only do that if you know it yourself. And I said to you as well that I'm, I can't just reel off scriptures I really struggle it's 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 a personal thing and I think it's good God knows that I'd get lazy but I have to keep reading the Bible every day I have to but you know if I need something it's amazing God prompts it because I've read it it's there in my um, storage box and my little man goes oh she stored that wrong again do, 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 do. picks it up pulls it out and then says it because I'm untidy in my brain as well as in my home. But find the key words and make it the scripture flexible. Make yourself flexible. Don't lie. Don't pull out bits that aren't right. I'm not saying that. But just make yourself flexible with what you're going to share. Because it says in 1 Corinthians 9, and I won't read it all. Um, it's 20 to 22. But it says, to the Jews I became a Jew. Um, to those under the law, I became one under the law. Uh, and then further down in 22, it's to the weak, I became weak to win the weak. I've become all things to all men so that by all, all possible means, I might save them. It's about getting alongside them and being what they need you to be. An evangelist will reflect the character of God and I think often we can forget this. It's no good preaching God, being great and wonderful, and then not living it out. It will not bring them to want to know. And that's why I say our motto, love God, love people, make a difference. We need to be living it out in our own lives. We need to be carrying who we are, being the person that God called us to be. Because how we live shouts a lot louder than the words we use. It's no good saying, I never ever get drunk, or I never drink. That's probably why I don't drink. It's disgusting, I don't drink. And then find myself, somebody sees me staggering down West Street. It's, it discredits me, for one, and it says... That, yeah, it discredits God, Lisa just said, but it also says that what I'm saying is not true. So, therefore, everything I've said isn't true. I'm here for this time to be vulnerable to you, to say my weaknesses. I've always been told that um, I shouldn't share everything. But I believe God is telling me in this time to share my struggles, to share my weaknesses, so that people really know that I'm real, that God is real, that my God is real, and that Jesus is getting me through. If I said everything were great, what's the point? Don't every, do you know what? A big car can make you feel good for a while. A fantastic house can make you feel great for a while. But the only thing 
that can give you comfort and make you feel good is the Holy Spirit living within you. Non-Christians will want, not want to listen to our message until they are convinced that our lives are indeed different. We need to show love to one another. Show that we love one another. Show that we support one another. Do you know if somebody hears that somebody in our fellowship is struggling and we've not jumped to it, what does that look like to those looking on? Celia broke down in um, Louth. I didn't see it till quite late because I was doing other things. But Tom offered, and I offered to go and pick her up and sort it, and it was already sorted by the time I did. But what witness is that? If she said, I need help and nobody comes and she has to go to uh, somebody else. Think about Half an hour, an hour of having to go and do something for somebody else could speak to thousands. Thousands, because it's on Facebook. An evangelist will invest time. I think I've said that. I don't know where I'm going now. 1 Thessalonians 2.8. We loved you so much that we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well, because you had become so dear to us. And evangelists will often share life with those who need to know Christ, but will often leave others to do the nurturing. During the pre-conversion time, they will spend so much time with that other person. Now, um, I'm sorry to keep using Ian, but he's the evangelist I know, particularly working at the moment. So everybody here knows that Ian really struggled with his own health. But even during that, the evangelist in him helped somebody else. And he's done it silently. Many of you won't even know the pers- the, the, what he's been doing. But he's been going to see somebody. He's gone to court with somebody Um, He has nurtured and taught real to them about Jesus in a life where he was on drugs, he was going to prison, and he was in a bad way. Relationship broken down, everything. He'd got nowhere to live at one point. But But Ian's done life with him. How long is it that he's been off drugs, Ian? Seven, eight months, yeah. It's time. That isn't, oh, just tell my story and go. That is time. He's invested time. He's shown this person that he cares for them. And sometimes at the detriment of spending some time with his wife. Just let me just say this. I'm sorry, I've got to just say this. Ian's got a new job. He loves it. Absolutely loves it. His wife would love you to ask him about it, so she, he talks less to her about it. So afterwards, speak to Ian about his new job, and then it will give Naomi a bit of a break. Anyway, <laughs> it's true though, isn't it? <laughs> when any of us share the gospel, it usually means sharing our life. Not everybody is saved in 10 seconds or 10 minutes. Sometimes it takes a long time. We have to unhook some of the pain or preconceived ideas that people have. If there are family or friends who want to, you want to reach out with, if there are family or friends that you want to reach out to, it's no good only ringing them when you've got a big evangelistic meeting. It's no good. Because they then, whenever they'll ignore your call, or oh, I've heard... There's a walk of witness. I ain't answering this call to man from Monday. I know what she'll be doing. It's true. It is so true. Don't just ring people to invite them to a meeting. We used to have challenges. Um, and I'm not, for some, some areas this may work, so I'm not discrediting it. But for me, it didn't work because I struggled. We used to have challenges that you got, you know, an Easter egg or whatever, if you invited people to an Easter service or a harvest or Christmas, do you know how many people come back from those services if they've never been in church before? Very, very few. Statistics say they, people invited 
to church events in that way are very unlikely to come back again. So why do we put so much effort? You see, when we come here, it's for us. This is for us to worship God. This is for us to to praise God. It's for us to be together, to love one another, to share with one another, to pray with one one another. This is not to bring non-Christians in. Because be honest, you all know me now. It's going to frighten them, isn't it? If they come and meet this mad woman on a Sunday without a dog collar and that jumps around and dances with kids, it's going to, they're going to wonder what church is all about. We should be meeting with people where they are. And where are they? Are they here on a Sunday? We should be going into the marketplaces. We should be going into the singing clubs. We should be going into the pubs and clubs. We should be part of the things that are on there. That doesn't mean you all get Sunday off. Don't miss me. You still have to come and you still have to tick your attendance sheet. Otherwise, you get a message from the pastor. Not really. But... It isn't about, it's about meeting them where they are. You know, if the Holy Spirit prompts you on a Sunday even to be in the marketplace because there's somebody going to be there that needs to know, I'm all for that. In fact, we could all go or we could all stop the service and pray. But generally, coming to church on a Sunday is to worship and glorify God, to come together, to learn, to know, get to know each other. Yeah? Yeah? When you're sharing, remember, be gentle. It said right at the beginning. Don't be harsh. Don't point the finger and tell them where they've gone wrong. Don't tell them, actually, you know, because you do that, God don't, can't look at you. Goodness me. The words we can use if we're not careful. There will be a time when you say, should you be doing that? But often it's the Holy Spirit that prompts Often it's the Holy Spirit that said, Mandy, should you really be doing that? It's time you stopped. Yeah. And you will find when God says that, sometimes a little voice pops back in and says, it's not true. You can carry on. It don't affect anyone. Still, You're still good. Trust always in the power of the gospel, but don't bash them on the head with the gospel you do not have to be concerned about how you deliver it salvation is the work of the Holy Spirit obedience to God's calling is what we need to be we need to be obedient to do our part and share our testimony evangelism is a gift but we all should be prepared to share our story. It's not just about a person's journey. It's about a person's destiny that is important. Today, we've been talking about the gift of evangelism, sort of, and I've said we all have a role in evangelism. To those around us, we know there are people here with the gift of evangelism, but it doesn't mean that we don't have a part as well so if you feel that whenever we're doing this it it might not be today it may be in future weeks that evangelism is your gift and you've got this stirring up of a way we can do something then let us know because the one thing we know about evangelists in our path martin and i path is not very good at organizing things and planning they have the ideas But somebody else has to start it up. And they'll be there. They'll be there to kick the shins of others. And they have the ideas. But they're not always that good at nurturing or organising. So, I think that's all I'm going to say. And I'm going to just finish in that statement I said earlier. That our story is not just about a person's journey. It's about their destiny, and that's what we should be doing. Amen.
somebody ring Tom. <laughs>